Uh, I'm your host, pop culture punk Chris Stiles, and it is my extreme pleasure to ask you guys to put your hands together for the incomparable and legendary Mr. Vernon Wells. Again, while he makes his way to the stage, a little bit of plug time. He has a film premiering this weekend, guys. Be sure to check this out. Jack B. Nimble, Bai Ling, who's also here, is in the film. I'm sure it's gonna be a good, great time. Is there anything you can tell us about this before we get into the rest of the stuff? No. <laughs> no, that's right. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> um, it's actually an interesting film. It's, it's based on Jack and the Beanstalk, and Jack is a very old man in a wheelchair, and he's in a home for the elderly with a lot of his idiot friends. And we have a, um, a demon from the underworld taking souls, and I have to fight it. Because nobody believes me that there's actually a demon, because I'm a dumb shit who says every time I see something, there's a demon. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Wow. I won't tell you I win. Oh, shit, sorry. God damn it. Um, no, you'll enjoy it. It's, it's just cool. And I did it all in a wheelchair, which was interesting to say the least. And he fell out of it twice, which was interesting also. But uh, yeah, please, if you can, come along tonight and watch it. It'll be, uh, it'll be really um, a good time. Awesome. Okay, I'm, uh, thank you. I'll just go. <laughs> oh. Damn it. And I'm going to leave this right here so it's on display for the whole time to remind you. Um, so, and again, I'll warm things up with a couple of questions, but as soon as I do see hands going up, I'm happy to start calling them out. Um, you have been all of our favorite villain growing up. Not just mine, everyone's favorite villain. So I have always wondered who were your favorite villains growing up? Me? <laughs> no. Um, the strange part about that is that I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere in Australia with my grandfather. So really the only things that I had to base anything on were morning cereals. And if I don't know if they ever had them in America, but they were on the radio. And it was like Superman and Batman and... And it was one of those wonderful things where it was like, tune in tomorrow, will Batman get out of the cave and the 7,000 tons of rock that are falling on him? And of course, being a kid, you went, oh my God, will he get out? And as you got older, you went, of course he's going to get out, for God's sake, they have another episode tomorrow. But we didn't know. So they were like my heroes at that stage that I uh, watched and listened to. But as I grew up and got into this business, I never wanted to be a villain, by the way. I never wanted to be an actor either, by the way. Um, but I got uh, coerced into being an actor by George Miller um, to do Road Warrior. And I didn't base the character on anybody I knew or saw in films. I sort of, we went in a whole different direction as is because George didn't want the character to be the same as everything else. He wanted him to be totally different. So asking me who my favorite villains were, I really don't know, to be blunt. I never ever sat down and said, what villains do I like? I've never really sat down and said, what actors do I like? Um, yeah, screw you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually like everybody that's a, you know in the business, and I like I love villains and watching them. Some of my favorite villains have to be the villains out of 007 because they are just so wonderful. And you know, Goldfinger is probably one of my favorites. You know, you think that's going to make me scared? No, Mr. Bond, it's going to kill you. I loved him. I thought, oh, God, why couldn't I say that? You know, I love Bond movies and Bond villains especially, but I got to say there isn't a Bond villain that could hold a candle to you, sir. Not a single one. Uh -huh. um, so, and I, we will get into the Road Warrior stuff a little bit, um, but before that, 
you were just discovered one, you know, by casting agents, right? Like you had no interest in pursuing I was, acting. I'm sorry, I was discovered by who? By casting agents. Is nope. that right? No. No, actually, I get asked this question all the time, and it's okay. We'll go into my private life. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I never wanted to be an actor. My mother was a very successful songwriter, and I worked in bands as a vocalist for quite, and that was to me where I was gonna be. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, no, it was actually sex and drugs that occasionally I sang. Um, but that was my life, and I got very badly hurt in a, an accident with a truck. I couldn't um, walk or do anything for about six months. And our manager got sick of me being a pain in his ass, so he took my photograph around to all the agencies in Melbourne where I lived in Australia, and one of them said, ah, we're doing this series of commercials, can he ride a horse? And he said, yeah, he owns about three of them, so I think so. And I said, great, he's hired. So I got to do these commercials. And I thought, wee, this is fun, and then I went, wee, this is boring as shit. So I stopped doing it, but what I loved was being behind the camera. It fascinated the hell out of me, and that's where I wanted to be, and I put all my energy into being a director. And I was asked to do a stage play called Hosanna, which was written by a French Canadian called Michel Tremblay, and it's basically about Montreal wanting to secede from Canada and become a, an autonomous um, French state and the Canadian government saying, go fuck yourself, it's not going to become an autonomous French state. And there was a whole big thing about it. So he wrote this stage play, but he couldn't actually say to the government. So he wrote it about a transvestite and her boyfriend. And it's one night in their lives where they have to solve a really heavy problem. So when they first asked me if I would do it, I went, What's it about? And they said, a transfer. I no. No. Excuse me. Grew up on a farm. I wrestle large bulls and shit. I do not wrestle other men. So I wouldn't do it. I just, yeah. Took, I think, about three months to convince me. And the person that convinced me was my brother, whom I was at home after they just kept pounding me with do it. You know, they wanted me to do it. I was um, at my family's house up in the hills in the country. I was talking to my brother. And you know, your brother's the one person you know is going to say, I'm with you, dude. I'm on your side. Yeah, right. So I'm telling my brother, and he's looking at me, and, he, uh, and I said, so, you know, dude, I can't do this. What do you think? And he went, well, if I was you, I'd just stop being a little fairy and get your act together and go and do the fucking thing. And I went... Okay, sure, why not, damn it. Opening scene in this play, I am dressed in leather. I come onto the stage and within, don't you pick on me this afternoon. I swear to God, I'll put you under the table and beat you to death. Um, I come on stage in fully dressed in leather within 40 seconds, I'm totally naked masturbating. The uh, front row is closer than you are to the end of my penis. <sighs> which was interesting to say the least. So I did this play and George Miller's fiance, Sandy Gore. In Australia we had a thing because if you're doing a play that's successful and there's other plays that are successful being done at the same time, once a month they have a late Friday night, like a 12 o'clock and all the people from other shows can come and watch it. And Sandy Gore, who was George Miller's um, fiance, came and saw it and rang George and said, I found Wes. And uh, didn't tell me, of course. And um, she came, uh, George came down and we had a little chat and a cup of coffee and he left and I still had no clue who he was. And I rang my manager and said, so um, <clears throat> I just had coffee with this guy called George Miller. Why? And she said, he wants you for his next movie. And I went, what's his next movie? And she said, the sequel to Road Warrior. And I said, what's a Road Warrior? And she said, you seriously haven't seen Road Warrior? Uh, no. 
said, um, <clears throat> I'd probably go and see it before you talk to George again. And I went, oh, okay. So just as luck would have a double header at the drive-in. Duel by Steven Spielberg, Road Warrior, uh, sorry, uh, Mad Max by George Miller. So I go and watch it. Next morning, she rings me, said, so what did you think? I said, Duel was the most fucking amazing movie. <laughs> and she said, what about Road Warrior, uh, uh, Mad Max? Yeah, it was okay. She said, I think I'd reverse that when you're talking to George. It might work better. So I, I really never wanted to do the film. Um, if I had my way, I would not have done it. I kept saying no, because it terrified me. And uh, George, unfortunately, when he decides that's the end of it, you doesn't matter what you do, he just, yeah, all right, you know, bugger off, you're doing it anyway. Um, and I went and did it. And when I finished it, I went back to directing. Because to me, that was it for me. I'd done my thing. I had 15 minutes of fame, done. Never again will I be in front of a camera. Hmm. 342 films later, I'm still saying it. I'll never get in front of a camera again. All right, but the last time. <laughs> so I always felt like with The Road Warrior, that's, you're looking at George Miller at like the peak of genius right there. Mm -hmm. Was there a, any moment when you got on set or when you realized like, wait a minute, this could be pretty awesome? Is there a moment where you kind of got a little more excited about it? No. <laughs> Whenever I was on set, they used me as a barometer. In fact, <clears throat> the gentleman who was the star of the film, whose name I will not mention, called me Barometer Bum. Because every time my ass went purple, Mel Gibson, by the way, uh, every time my ass went purple, they would say, we should get them warmed up, Vernon's ass is purple. Um, so I was the barometer for how cold it was. We froze. Everybody says to me, what? The skies were blue. Uh -huh. We were in a valley between two mountains covered in snow. What do you think? We froze to death. So uh, no, at no time did I go, wow, this is so much fun. Um, we knew it was going to be successful in Asia and Australia. That was it. That the original one was hugely successful in Japan and Asia and Australia and was a complete flop in America because they dubbed it with American voices. So nobody had any uh, high hopes of it being what it became. I mean, it just suddenly all our lives changed. Yeah, one of those things where, whoops. And was there, do you remember any controversy around the titling of the movie, um, being Mad Max 2 versus The Road Warrior and different? Uh, that was, in every other country, it's Mad Max 2. Um, in America, because the first one was not successful, they did not want to associate the second one with it, so it became The Road Warrior. And in a lot of places, you'll see The Road Warrior, you'll see The Road Warrior, and under it will have Mad Max 2. Um, and that was just because they didn't want it to uh, be associated with it. Of course, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars it's made since, but it became kind of a hit, I think. It's funny, when I was a kid, I always thought it was just one of those cute titles. I was like, oh, that's like Rambo First Blood Part Two. Like, it's awesome because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I know. Not a lot in it made sense. Come on, seriously. No. <laughs> So you mentioned the costume, of course. Uh, do you, uh, I imagine there's a bit of a love-hate relationship with that, especially if you're freezing uh, in that. Do you remember the first time seeing it and uh, any moment of embracing it? Or? Yeah. They actually took me up to Sydney to do a wardrobe and makeup test. So they shaved my head um, into the mohawk for a start because... I had to get used to being in the sun, as you would know. If you go out in the sun and you're not prepared, you get sunburnt because your head is, the hair stops you getting sunburnt. So I had to have my head shaved about three months before we started filming. 
And then they um, wanted to do all the costume, but they wouldn't let me see it. They did it in a room that had no mirrors. And they just dressed me in the costume, put it on, did all this shit to it. All I could see was my crutch. And I kept thinking, oh, this is going to be so bad. I'm going to hate this. And they then took me over to George Miller, who was uh, standing in front of his desk. And he was looking at me, and he went, uh-huh, hmm. And I said, George, I don't think I can do this. And he went, uh-huh, hmm. Turn around. When I turned around, there was a full-length mirror. I turned around, and I saw me, and I went, oh, fuck. And he went, yeah, you'll do. <laughs> so it was once I had the whole costume and makeup on, I became the character. Until that moment, no, I, I just could not, did, did, no. But once I was in that costume without makeup, I was like, whoa, shit, I can do this. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I've, I don't know if I've you know, heard this right, it's just the legend of you know, filmmaking, but I, I was told that, you know, and I think I'd read that Road Warrior was kind of a run and gun shoot, like shot quickly on the move. Um, but then when I rewatched it recently, I swear, every frame you're in looks like a painting. So. I wonder if you could talk to that, did they take a you know, meticulous amount of time setting up shots or was it more of a run and gun type of shoot? Now George is, how it works with George Miller is my first, he, that was my first film, the first major thing I did in my life. Um, and George has a unique way of doing things. He made us write a biography of our character from the day we were born till the day the film started. And we had five days, and every day, everyone except Mel, because Mel had did the, done the first film. So he was sort of established in his character. But we'd come in and we'd sit around a table, all the main uh, actors in the film, and we would read what we'd written about our biography. And the three writers, which were George Miller, Terry Hayes, and Brian Hanna, would listen, and they'd be, this, this is how it would go. That's crap. That is so much dumb shit. <laughs> Write it again. That was basically what we did for four days. By the end of four days, the fifth day, we're all like on, on like, I'm never gonna get this right. And, but the thing was, by the fifth day, we had it down perfectly. We knew exactly who the character was, so we wrote it all the way. And I got, I was very close to George because I was the newbie and he was very like protective and so was Mel, believe it or not. Mel was very protective of me. And uh, George would show me the things he was doing to try to get my confidence in who I was up and he, he graphs the whole film from start to finish. Every frame is a graph of, of how, and he used to say to me, it's like a, <clears throat> um, one of those e-ticket rides at the, at the park. You know, you go up, 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 up to the top of the hill, and it's all very slow. Then you just go down the hill, and at the end of the hill, there's a brick wall. And you're going, oh, fuck. And the point is, your brain hits the brick wall, the character moves to the left. That was the brilliance of George Miller. He could make you see things that weren't on film. And I will sit at my table. It hasn't happened this time, for but it will. You watch. Someone will come up to me and say, oh, that scene in Mad Max where you... And I go, actually, no, we didn't do that. And they'll argue with me that I did because it was in the film. But it actually wasn't in the film. It's just something they thought they saw. And that's the brilliance of how George does it. As for doing it, we shot that thing so fast, you have no idea. Yeah, we were just like every day going, going, going. All the scenes at the end where we do the big chase, the whole thing, we shot in a day. Shot in a day? Shot in a day. A day, wow. Oh my God, well I was, I was just about to ask about that actually. Um, that must have been a terrifying day of shooting. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, yeah. I nearly got killed three times, so, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> it was interesting to say that, because I was just a dumbass kid who was an ex-football player who just had no fear. 
Wow. You know, put me on a truck and say, we're going to jump from there to there, and the semi trailer is going to be doing 30 mile an hour, and the truck you're coming up in will be doing 50, and you just got to jump, and if you miss, you're going to go under three sets of wheels. Okay. Let's do it. The things this man has done to entertain us, right? Like, <laughs> incredible. Uh, so, one of the next roles that came your way, obviously, was Weird Science. Yeah. So, you want to talk about how that came about? Weird Science was, um, it was funny because when it came up, I went, nope. I say no a lot, by the way. Uh, nope, I'm not doing it because I've done it. I'm sorry, I'm out of here. And uh, they kept, and it was funny, Americans have a different idea to Australians. In Australia, if you say no, bugger off, that's it. In America, if you say no, bugger off, they offer you more money. And. Joel Silver, and it was funny, last week, no, three weeks ago, I was with the cast of, of the film, because we all get together occasionally at these things, and I was doing this, and I was telling them about what happened, and they went, uh-huh, and you know what it was like on the other end? Every day, Joel Silver would come on the set, and he'd go, that fucking Australian, I don't know who the hell he thinks he is, he's not that fucking special, because he would keep offering more money, and I'd keep going, Nope. And so with more money, nope. And he thought that we were being assholes and wanting more money. And finally, my agent said to me, um, seriously, if you're not on the next plane to America, I'm going to have my brother come and break both your legs, you son of a bitch. Because <laughs> he was offering a lot of money. So I came to America and did it. And the one thing that got me to do the film, more so than the bullshit with Joel Silver offering me money, was that I actually read up on the director and realized who he was. He'd done all these, you know, young kid angst movies, you know, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, all this shit. And I went, this is going to be fun. And that was what persuaded me to come and do the film. So I came over and we had a lot of fun. Wow. Um. So you also got to work with a, another villain that a lot of us grew up with on Weird Science uh, in Michael Berryman. Did yep. you guys uh, have a good time together? Any stories there? Michael is one of the most adorable human beings. I mean, he has a heart that is so wonderful. And the funny thing about that is the first day on set, the one of the um, co-producers came up to me and said, you will, one of your co-stars, has um, birth defects and um, it would be polite if you didn't stare or make a comment. And I'm thinking, okay, this is gonna be interesting. First person I run into is Michael, who is the one with birth defects. And the first thing he does is cuddle me. And I'm like, I love you, you are such a cool dude. And I never saw one thing because it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside, and that guy is just all love and affection. And I was like, what the fuck are you people on about? So it's just, you know, sometimes it's, I, I guess people expect you'll be a certain way. I remember being put up at the hotel on the, the um, it's just beside Universal. We call it the Black Tower. It's this big hotel. First morning, I come down, to go to the set, and I'm all like, eh, eh, eh. and I walk out the front door, and down the hill is Universal Studios. There's this limo there, and this gentleman says, oh, Mr. Wells, so I went, uh, yes, he said, your car, sir. I went, I'm sorry? He said, your car. I went, aren't we shooting in the studio? He said, yes, sir. You're gonna drive me down the hill? He said, yes, sir. Why? That's my job, sir. You know, I wanna walk down the hill for exercise. <laughs> he said, I can't allow you to do that, sir. I'll be fired. I went, okay. Um, tell you what, you drive the car down beside me. I'll walk down the hill. We pull up at the bottom. I get in the car. You drive through the gate. You take me to the studio. And when you pick me up tonight, you drive me through the gate, I get out and I walk up the hill and you follow me. Does that work? And he went, yes, sir. So that's what I did for three weeks. <laughs> it's just ridiculous to me, you know, a limo to drive down, oh boy. 
<laughs> that is incredible. Um, so, obviously, I have to ask about Commando. Um, <laughs> it, uh, the Commando came up kind of last minute for you, right? Uh, <laughs> no, actually, it came up while I was doing Weird Science. Joel Silver uh, came up to me and said, I'm doing a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I said, who? He said, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I went, okay. He said, Mr. World, bodybuilder. Okay. <laughs> I had no idea who Arnold Schwarzenegger was. And he said, we'd really like you to be the villain. And I went, oh, okay. Went to see the director, and the director went, nope. <laughs> I've already cast that role. I went, okay. I was happy. I went back to Australia. And uh, about two and a half months later, <laughs> funny story to that too, um, they called and they actually got my flatmate. I had a house and a friend of mine was living at the house with me. And they got him on the phone. They said, we need to speak urgently to uh, Vernon. And he said, oh, um, He's not here. And they said, oh, can you get a message to him? And he went, um, okay, what's the message? They said, he needs to ring Joel Silver now. And he went, oh, shit. So beside our phone was a little black book with all the women and, and with little things. Beside, anyway, he started at A and worked his way through ringing all these people until finally he got me and said, uh, Joel Silver needs you to ring. And I said, do you have any idea what I'm doing? He said, I know what you're doing, but Joel Silver needs you to ring. And I went, tell Joel Silver to go fuck himself. I'll call him tomorrow morning. And so he went, sure, whatever, I don't give a shit. So I thought, ah, oh, shit, I better call Joel Silver. And I rang Joel and he said, you know, we need you back in America, you're doing commando. And I said, but they didn't want me to do commando. He said, things have changed. So I flew over to America. They'd been shooting for three weeks. It hadn't worked with the guy that was doing it. Apparently he was taller and slimmer and Arnold was really concerned about the fact that it would look like he could break him in half in the fight scene at the end. So they got me. Um, I arrived, they didn't have a costume, they put me in a costume that didn't fit me. That's why everybody says, boy, your costume was, well, yeah, it didn't fucking fit me, it wasn't mine. But um, we got all that sorted out, and I was, the first morning, I was so tired. <laughs> she seen me when I'm tired, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, what? I wasn't there a lot. And we're doing the, the first scene I shot in that film was the scene in it where I've got the knife to Arnold Schwarzenegger's throat. And I'm saying, if I had my way, I would have cut your throat, you son of a bitch. Um, and that was the first scene. But I never at any time in rehearsals went near him. I was watching where the camera was, the lights and all this shit and trying to get my bearings of what I was doing. And the story goes, Arnold called Joel over and said, in a loud voice. I don't think, uh, oh, hang on, I'll do my Arnold. I don't think this is gonna work, he's a pussy. See, there's things you don't say in front of Australians. Pussy being one of them. So it's like, uh-huh. So I'm just standing there, action. I leap on Schwarzenegger with a pretend knife. I've got a jack so far up his ass he can't breathe. Do the whole thing. Director says, cut, great print, love it. Joel Silver walks over and says, so, Ani, do we go ahead? Do we recast or what? And he, apparently he looked at Joel Silver and went, never give him a real knife. And that was it. We became good friends after that. Such good friends that the son of a bitch took every nut and bolt out of my trailer and let it collapse around me. That was because I kept bitching about having a little trailer. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to shut up, you know, just, just keep your fucking mouth shut, you dumbass. I did that twice when I was doing um, Inner Space. I had, you probably asked me a question on that too. I had to go to um, San Francisco and they did body casts of me because i become a little thing. And they were shooting down there as well at the, um, the ranch. 
And everybody had these huge trailers. And I had a little trailer. It wasn't because they didn't like me, it was because they ran out of trailers and I came into it late. So my trailer wasn't as big. So all I did was bitch about my little trailer. And the third day I came onto the set and my little trailer's gone. And I went into the first AD and I went, um, where's my trailer? He said, it's out where it usually is. And I went, uh, no, it's not there. He said, yes, it is. I said, it's not there. He said, oh, for Christ's sake, come on, I'll take you out. So he takes me out. And there, I swear to God, there is a trailer that's 3,000 feet long. It is the biggest thing on wheels I've ever seen in my life. And he said, there. And I went, fa, 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 what? He said, that's your trailer. And I went, oh, fuck. It had two bedrooms, a kitchen, a dining room, and right at the end of it, it had a, a sofa in front of the door. For three weeks, guess where I was? On the sofa in front of the door. I was terrified if I went anywhere else, they would never find me. <laughs> they would come to get me to come to set, and I would be lost here somewhere. So I went nowhere. I sat right in front of the door in this huge trailer. So I learned, shut the fuck up. So I've read about your approach to Bennett, and I gotta say, it's absolutely my favorite take I've ever heard an actor say their, their approach to playing a villain. I was wondering if you could talk about that for the people here. Huh? What did I say? Um, your, your approach to playing Bennett, it's, like, it's one of my favorite takes uh, of the, you know, that anyone's ever had of a character that they play. So do you wanna talk about that, like your, you know, what you saw as Bennett's motivation and, th and things like that? Oh, I don't know what I said, but I can remember what my motivation was. I was being paid. No, <laughs> no. Um, well, I, well I, I think if I remember it right, you played it that Bennett was in love with Matrix, or there was a little bit of that tension there? Actually, no, I didn't say that. That was somebody else that said somebody that Somebody else, okay, oh, my apologies. Yep. No, no, my whole thing for Ben, uh, for Bennett was that Bennett believed he was better than Matrix. And his whole thing was to prove to Bennett that he was better than him. The thing about me being in love with him came about because, remember Siskel and Ebert? When Road Warrior came out, they did a big review on it and said, um, it's a wonderful movie, and the lead character is very, very gay. Thank you, Siskel and Ebert. When Commando came out, they went, will they ever stop using this gay man to be a villain? He seems to be in love with all these leading men. Right on. See, I was always taught that a good villain is not a villain at all. A good villain is a good guy who's doing what he thinks he should do and considers the, the good guy to be the villain because he's trying to stop him from doing. So you reverse the situation. Because if you play a villain as a villain, number one, it's boring as shit. Um, and so I always try to put in the villain that I'm playing an appreciation for the person I'm fighting. And the thing with Schwarzenegger and with Mel was not that I was in love with them, was that I was in awe of who they were because I wanted to be who they were. That was the whole point. But according to Siskel and Ebert, I was gay and loved them and you know, yeah, what the fuck, I don't care. That's where you got that from, by the way. Okay, that's where it came from. Well, again, my apologies about that. That's okay. Uh, I do want to give the audience a chance to get in there, guys. I don't want to hog the mic too nah, much. No, fuck them. So. I'm not going to answer their question. All right, all right. Well, well, you guys are still shy, and we're still on commando. I do want to ask about one of the greatest lines in movie history, of course, let off some steam, Bennett. And that uh, scene, was that, um, you know, how was that done? Was there, like, prosthetics involved, or was it, you know, do you have any memories of that? Um, Arnie and I, by the time we got to that scene, I had a broken elbow, he had a broken collarbone. We 
were like two big kids pissing up a wall to see who could piss the highest. I mean, serious to God, we're the same. He's a, actually half an inch shorter than me, but don't tell him that. And he was two pound heavier than me. His was muscle, mine was you. Um, but we were both big boys. And <laughs> it was just a lot of fun. And when we got to that scene, the scariest part of that scene was they actually had me rigged with a, a rig across my uh, stomach, but I had a little four by four patch that was here, which was um, leather and steel on my stomach. And that was so that the uh, thing would not actually go through me. And uh, when they were getting it all set up, I was standing there looking because they had a line attached to it that went out into space on top of a 12-foot ladder. And I sort of looked up, and on top of the 12-foot ladder was Arnold Schwarzenegger with this large pipe in his hand. And I went, oh, fuck. And he just looked at me, and he went, this won't hurt a bit, Bennett. <laughs> I had a bruise that covered most of my body. He went, Oof. and the, the reaction you see from me when I go back into, that was how far that thing pushed me, for me through it so hard. That wasn't the hard part. They now had to do all the close-ups of where I'm holding the thing and there's steam coming out of it. They had me rigged in a suit and they had, um, uh, what do they call it? Dry ice. They had dry ice in the actual tube, and then they put water on it, which made it start to smoke. Unfortunately, nobody realized that the dry ice would form a barrier in the actual thing. So what was happening, the, they were putting hot water into the tube to melt the dry ice quickly so they could get the smoke. And I was holding it level, and it was very heavy. And we were setting the shot up, and they went action. And when they went action, I brought the pipe up, like, and it just hit me, and all the steam's coming out. That's when he goes, let off some steam, Bennett. Well, what actually happened was when it came up, it went through the dry ice wall onto my body, scalding hot water, and I was in a, this thing that was around me that I couldn't move, and all I could do was go, whoa, and the, the special effects guy just saw my face, and he raced over with a knife and cut me out of this suit, and my whole body looked like I was really badly sunburned. And... The guys were so brilliant at what they did. They grabbed me, kept me away from touching anything, and got, um, oh, what do you call that wrap you put over? Oh, uh, the clear. clear oh, uh, uh, you put it over uh, when you've got wrap? Uh, saran wrap. They got saran wrap and wrapped my body in saran wrap and then sent me to hospital. And the doctor at the hospital said, you won't have any scarring because they were smart enough to do that so the air didn't have a chance to get to the burns and that's what scars you. So I spent two days having all this shit put on me and then I was back finishing the film. But it was uh, an interesting time. But I always say if I don't get a broken arm, leg, face, nose or burnt in a film then it wasn't very good. Because I tend to get hurt in everything. I was doing a film where I get shot four times. The guy putting the squibs on me, one was in my head, and I refused to allow him to do it because he worried me. So I had four squibs going up my body that would go off. And he was a little stoned at the time. And when they did the shot, no one realized. And when they did the shot, he had rigged it up wrong so that as the one here went off, it started to ignite up my body and then the next one went off, so now it was bigger. The third one went off, it's up to, and then the fourth one, and my whole face was enveloped in flames. And uh, the only thing that saved me that time from being very badly burnt 
was the cameraman, the AD, had a, a fire extinguisher in case anything went wrong, was frozen, just looking at me on fire. The cameraman who had a 35 mil camera dropped it off his shoulder. His assistant <laughs> caught it and went flat on his back on the floor with his fucking great camera on top of him. And he grabbed the fire extinguisher off the first AD and sprayed me down and put the fire out. So all I did was I lost both my eyebrows and a little bit of hair, that was it. But I could have been very seriously burned. So, you know. My God, the things this man has done to entertain <laughs> us in kind of fun, incredible though. films. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, but be sure to stop by his table, get some autographs, get some pictures. I know he has got a lot more stories to tell you guys. No, I don't. And to put your hands together for the amazing Vernon Wells. Thank you. Uh, actually, before we go, um, there's one thing I always do, and I don't have a choice in this. This is who I am. I am Buddhist. I mean, my wife is Japanese American and a Buddhist, and so I'm a very bad Buddhist, by the way. Um, but I am a Buddhist, and the one thing that I always like to say is, from my heart to your heart, May all the blessings of Buddha, everything that you desire, may you receive, and may every day of your life be so much better than the one before, and may you have nothing but joy and success. And thank you so much because of you. I am who I am, and I appreciate it, and I thank you for it. Hey, this is Alex Malari Jr. and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. Your emperor commands it. Thanks for watching.